Hello, and good morning or good afternoon, wherever you might be. Um, welcome to our latest Future Tense uh, conversation. Uh, Future Tense, for those of you who uh, don't know, is a collaboration between Arizona State University, America, and Slate Magazine. And what, what we do is we look at the impact of technology on society. We do so with terrific articles on Slate. I say terrific because they're edited by my colleague, um, Tori Bosch, who's amazing. You can follow us on Twitter at Future Tense now. And uh, my name is Andres Martinez, by the way. I am the editorial director of Future Tense, and I'm also a professor of practice at the Cronkite School at Arizona State University. Today feels almost like a family celebration because we are here because one of our favorite Future Tense contributors, Jeff, Jeff Kossif, has published his latest book, and it is on a fantastic subject. So what brings us here together is the issue of anonymity um, and the question of whether we have a right to separate our advocacy and our speech, our messaging from our identity. Um, Jeff's new book, The United States of Anonymity, How the First Amendment Shaped Online Speech. It's, it's one of these awesome topics because oftentimes these issues play out in the online space and in the internet. And <clears throat> people often discuss them as if we have never seen anything like this before, right? And so one of the things that we try to do um, at Future Tense, and we've done so for the last couple of years in our free speech project, and, and Jeff is really great at this, is to provide context about underlying principles and, and history too that informs a lot of these debates and these new trade-offs that are being negotiated and navigated um, in a new space, but that are actually not entirely novel um, to put it mildly, I mean, when you look at the history of anonymous speech in the United States, it goes back to the very foundation of the re Republic and has been uh, an interesting tension throughout um, with tremendous uh, rights given to people thanks to anonymity, but at, at a cost. And I'm really excited to, to have Jeff and, and Nora uh, tease that out. Um, also, just in terms of housekeeping, you'll notice there are buttons on the bottom of your screen where you can you can purchase Jeff's book. Um, uh, for those of you who uh, also might have read Jeff's previous book, The 26 Words That Created the Internet, and um, spoiler alert, that's that's our favorite section 230, um, you know how masterful Jeff is at bringing these issues to life. Um, and that's why we love publishing him at, at Future Tense as well. You can also pose questions, post questions down below, and we'll be referring to audience questions throughout the conversation. So I mainly want to get out of the way at this point and learn from Jeff and Nora. Uh, in terms of a slightly more formal introduction, I should say that Jeff is also, um, it, you know, <clears throat> I mentioned his previous book and my, my phone here is frozen. So I'm, I want to make sure I get his title right. He is, Jeff is the associate professor at the, in a science, a cyber science department at the U.S. Naval Academy. Um, and of course, the author of the just published United States of Anonymity. Um, really um, honored today to have Nora help us out in guiding the conversation. Uh, Nora Benavides is a senior counsel and director at the Di Digital Justice and Civil Rights Program at Free Press. And she is also an ASU colleague in that she is a faculty associate at the Cronkite School of Journalism and Mass Communication, where she is sharing a lot of her uh, wisdom and expertise on First Amendment issues to our Cronkite students um, who are fortunate to have her. So thanks, Jeff and Nora, uh, for doing this with us. And um, Nora, I'd like to pass the, the moderating baton to you to, to guide us in this conversation. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Andres. And thank you to the rest of the Future Tense team. It's, uh, it's really wonderful to be here. I remember when we used to be in person for events like these, and I lament that to some extent. But Jeff, it's wonderful to to see you here. Uh, before we get really started, why don't you give your typical, your sort of go-to disclaimer? I know you often give that. <laughs> yes, thank you. Uh, and I almost forgot. So yeah, everything I say uh, today is only on my behalf, not on behalf of the Naval Academy, the Department of Navy, or the Department of Defense. My family doesn't want to take credit for what I say. It's just, just my own <laughs> Oh, I love it. I, if you've watched Jeff speak before, that's his boilerplate and he does it every time. And I sort of feel like we can't now have our discussion without it. I, I look forward to it in a very surreal way. We, we can't <laughs> set military policy on this, so uh, we have to be really careful. <laughs> 
Good, good. Um, well, it's great to be here with everyone. I will keep reminding you, if you have questions, please put them in the Slido and I'll be peppering questions from the audience throughout our discussion together. We have about 50 minutes with Jeff and I really wanna dive in because this topic is one I think about all the time. And as a little bit of background, I will just say, Jeff has now written three books. I think I'm right on that, a textbook, the, of course, very well-known uh, 26 words that created the internet, and now the United States of Anonymity, which explores how the internet age has been shaped by and how it has continued to now shape the First Amendment and our conceptions of free speech. As a little bit of historical background, I, I just sort of want to set the stage for us. In the United States, the ability to speak or engage without revealing one's identity has incredibly deep historical ties. From the earliest days in this country, people have often sought anonymity as a way to shield themselves and to then be able to address difficult or controversial questions in our public spaces. And Jeff, you've written about this, of course, in your new book. I would love to just sort of open up first some of the history of what anonymity has meant in this country. There are so many examples, whether it's the authors of the Federalist Papers, other cases from the early Supreme Court days. Tell us just a little bit about what the right to be anonymous has meant in this country. Well, so yeah, that, that's a great way to open it. And it, it really, so the right to be anonymous, really, in terms of being a First Amendment right, didn't really start to be recognized until the 1950s. Um, but to really understand why it was recognized, uh, you have to go back to even before the founding of our country to look at what was the way that people spoke about particularly important and difficult political issues. And uh, overwhelmingly, it was anonymously or under pseudonyms. So uh, you had Thomas Paine writing uh, Common Sense, signing it, signing it written by an Englishman. Uh, you had the letters from the farmer from Pennsylvania. Um, you, you had the, uh, after we had independence, we had the Federalist Papers that uh, argued for the ratification of the Constitution that Hamilton, Madison, and Jay wrote under Publius. And they kept their identity pretty secret. And they had a few people who knew at the time that it was them and a lot of people speculated, but I mean, they even went to the extent of using Cypher to communicate their, um, to, to, to communicate, to shield their identities from being disclosed. So, and there were anti-federalists who wrote under pseudonyms. So that was just the tradition of speech, but it didn't really come up in terms of uh, whether there's a First Amendment right to be anonymous until the late 50s, sort of right after Brown versus Board of Education. You had the NAACP that was uh, getting into trying to uh, get Alabama and other states to, de to desegregate uh, under the Brown ruling and uh, Alabama pushed back. And one way that they w tried to push back was to find this loophole in a corporation's registration statute, basically saying that NAACP did not properly register in the state. So they filed a lawsuit to shut down, rather than saying just file the right form, that wasn't the state's objective. Uh, they wanted to shut down the NAACP, but even more alarmingly, as part of the discovery, forced the NAACP to disclose its membership lists, which obviously uh, would expose uh, members in the South to mm -hmm. a lot of retaliation potentially. So the NAACP challenged this and it went up to the Supreme Court and the Supreme Court ruled unanimously that there is a right to anonymous association and uh, that under the First Amendment. And then two years later, they extended that to strike that right to speech to strike down uh, an ordinance that required the authors of handbills to put their name on them. And in that opinion in 1960, the Supreme Court wrote, this is based on our tradition of anonymous speech going back to the Federalist Papers and these foundational documents. And the court has uh, since then reaffirmed the, the right in various contexts. It's not absolute. And there are uh, a number of cases, particularly in the campaign finance disclosure setting where right. the court has required disclosure. But 
Um, it, it's a, it's a fairly strong right, and it's much stronger than the the any fundamental right of anonymity in many other countries. Mm -hmm. Well, and my understanding is that, you know, this right to be anonymous has different protections in different contexts. And as you already alluded, there are these rights or the kinds of protections as part of speech and association rights, which are quite high, I would say, uh, when it comes to how the court has, you know, valued what anonymity means for engaging in discourse at that level. But then there are those less protective areas and campaign finance is certainly one of them. And then there is this newer and burgeoning area, if we can even call it burgeoning at this point in time, around speech online. And it feels like we've arrived there maybe some years ago. Your book, of course, focuses on anonymous speech and what, uh, how that has sort of been shaped by the First Amendment. But what for you at a personal level prompted the new book? Because we've sort of gone through as quickly as possible in these first five minutes, the, the long history of what anonymity means, the value of it. And I'm curious, coming now to present day, you know, why you wanted to talk about and, and write about this book uh, topic now? Yeah, so it really was, it, it was not a subject that I spent a tremendous amount of time on as an academic. Uh, but it was really an outgrowth of the Section 230 work, because one of the main sort of to distill the summary of Section 230 by its most ardent defenders, they say all that Section 230 says is that you can't sue the platform for defamatory or otherwise illegal content, but you can sue the person who posted it or who wrote it. And that that sounds pretty straightforward, but then it's not always true. And it's not true for a few different reasons. And many of them get to anonymity. The poster may have been using their neighbor's Wi-Fi connection. They might be using Tor. They might be at a coffee house that doesn't require authentic logins. Or even if they are using their own internet connection, uh, what I, I was aware of, but I had not really pursued in depth, was that, that courts had uh, set a fairly high standard to be able for a plaintiff in a defamation suit or some other related uh, type of claim to use a subpoena to unmask an anonymous poster. And I really found that fascinating. And I've got to admit, when I started, when I when I started sort of the research and reading every case I could about anonymity, I was much more sympathetic to the plaintiffs because the cases that I hear about are involve sympathetic plaintiffs, people who have in, suffered from harassment and really horrific defamation, which I read about in the book. But what I found and what sort of changed, made, made, made everything more complex, which is fun when you're writing a book, is that um, I found that so many of these cases uh, where people are trying to be unmasked, the plaintiffs are big companies that are trying to figure out which employees criticize mm -hmm. them. And mm -hmm. that I'm not as sympathetic about. I mean, obviously there could be, there, there have been some legitimate claims by these companies, but what, I, what we found going back to the 1990s, when you first had Yahoo Finance have a bulletin board where any pseudonymous person could go on and post about companies was that, it really revolutionized the way that companies had to deal with criticism that um, before Yahoo Finance and before the modern internet, the criticism that companies received publicly was primarily from business journalists. And they, they knew how to deal with that. They yeah. complain, uh, but they knew who it was. But the idea that some lowly employee could have the nerve to go to the world and say that the CEO is doing something that's not wise, um, that got under their skin and they wanted to figure out how to deal with it. And they, un until you had uh, civil liberties groups, you had uh, folks like Paul Levy, the EFF, um, you went, until you had them really get in and it took years to basically get the courts to set high standards, but the, the companies were able to use this process to basically figure out who posted. They, they had no real interest in actually litigating the case. They would typically use the subpoena to unmask the person, dismiss the case, fire them, and often make it more difficult for them to get a job again. And 
um, that's when you start to see the sort of the the power rationales for anonymity mm -hmm. that you have. I mean, a lot of these employees, I mean, some of them just didn't like their supervisor or they had grudges, but I mean, a lot of them were exposing really bad stuff that was happening or warning people like, hey, you don't want to work here. Uh, and they they were really, and there, I, I personally have a problem with companies using our legal system and the power of a subpoena to unmask someone because they're not comfortable with being criticized. Mm -hmm. Well, I want to come back to some of that because that's so fascinating. I guess I, I have a lot of questions, Jeff. Before we keep going, I want to make another flag. Please put questions for all of you that are tuning in to our Slido. Um, I'll be peppering those throughout the discussion. So we want to make it as interactive as possible. And this is your one chance to be with the, the complete legend that is Jeff. So please, please uh, drop questions in. Um, you know, one of the things when I first started reading the book is, um, you know, I just sort of thought to myself, what an odd and exciting uh, perspective to take on that you're dealing with online speech, given your previous book, but also citing the First Amendment, and that there is this weird tension I pick up on very early on in the book and thinking about where responsibility lies, where the legal remedies are for people who are victims. And I don't just mean those types uh, of victims that are major companies trying to seek out who an anonymous complainant was, but really the, the more horrific stories. And those are jarring. Um, there is such a long line of anecdotal and research studies that look at how online abuse has affected people, that it is when, you know, the perpetrators are anonymous, their anonymity is a shield against any kind of remedy for victims who are silenced for any number of reasons, whether it's journalists or political dissidents. And so I would love for you to just sort of walk the audience through a little bit of what some of those stories look like and how did that shape the way you thought of the book? So are you talking about both sort of the positive uses and the heart, the benefits? Yeah, on the so, yeah. So yeah, I mean, I, I think that um, the in terms of the benefits, I mean, there, there are so many. I write about uh, a privacy blogger named Descent Doe, who uh, I, I have long read, and uh, she is a, uh, a psychologist, and she has a real interest in privacy, particularly data breaches and health privacy, and she really gets in there. She reports on hackers who we all have reason to be afraid of <laughs> and, and she 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 gets and she also reports on companies that uh have really recklessly exposed customer data and so she has really good reason to be anonymous so i i talk about her stories and the harassment that she's faced um but but also the the various rationales um I talk about um, my personal experiences with anonymity um, that, that I've, I mean, I, I've used online bulletin boards. There's one in DC, uh, DC Urban Moms and Dads, where people about a variety of subjects, about health, finance, jobs, where people, it's the default is anonymous. You can't, you can, I guess, write your name in the comment, but there's no, everyone posts as anonymous. And it's moderated, so like the anything that's really abusive gets taken down. But um, what I find is people are incredibly candid, far more candid than you would be with anyone other than maybe your closest, closest friends or relatives. Uh, and even in that case, you might not be. Um, and you how do you think that is, Jeff? I'm curious. I know that's a sort of known psychological effect of online anonymity. Yeah, well, be, because you can be honest about, you know, this is, this was a time that I messed up at work, or this was, um, th this was a really tough time in my relationship, uh, something that you would not, uh, that, that I think a lot of people would not definitely post publicly where it could be Googled and their name would come up, but even like with a casual acquaintance, you wouldn't typically say a lot of that. Um, mm -hmm. And the, I mean, there, there are so many other uses. Um, there, there, there are some uses that are controversial. I write about a 
website called Make Them Scared, which was uh, started by moderators who say, and I've, I emailed with them, I, I don't know what their identities are, but they're anonymous and they say they were University of Washington students who were during the Me Too revelations in 2018. They realized that a lot of the the a lot of the coverage was from people who involving people who were very prominent, and they wanted to give a voice to the many uh, the many women who were students at college uh, who had who who wanted to have their voice heard, and they recognized that they often wouldn't want their name associated with the allegations. So they actually start started a website with a list where people submit. Um, names of uh, assaulters and harassers and the stories. And I talk about the complex interaction with anonymity that um, the, so the men are named and there's a lot of criticism about uh, having the men, the men named, the moderators started requiring the post, the submitters to actually just at least give their email address on their social media profile so they could verify and try to adjudicate disputes um and, and i mean it's gotten criticized quite a bit but it, it i think it just demonstrates the power dynamic with anonymity again setting aside sort of the judgment about whether it should should be there um and then there are some truly disturbing uses of anonymity that um i so so uh, the one that i spend the most time on that uh, Slate had actually reprinted involves someone named Ryan Lynn, who was sentenced yeah. to 17 and a half years in prison, which is a very high sentence for a cyber harassment and stalking related crime. Um, and he, I, I found out about this, uh, one, one of my very good friends is Carrie Goldberg, and she runs a law firm that is dedicated to helping victims of online harms. Um, and I went to her and I said, you know, I'm writing this book about anonymity and we, we disagree about a lot. Uh, I also value her. <laughs> we, we disagree about Section 230 quite a bit. Um, <laughs> I was going to add. But, oh, we, we, we do. But <laughs> talk, talking with her um, always makes my knowledge, expands my knowledge about 230 and it challenges my views and that's good. And so I said, you know, I'm writing about anonymity. Have you had any cases, of any really tough cases involving anonymity and she immediately said yeah right, the ryan lynn case and mm -hmm. so this was a case where he was in his 20s he, he had been a computer science major he moved into a house with a few other people who were around the same age um he was only there for a month there was a dispute particularly with one female roommate and uh he was able to access her uh, online passwords because her laptop had been unsecured. Uh, and so he was able to get into all of her accounts and, uh, and uh, find out intimate things, details about her life, as well as access intimate images. And for several months after, he used Tor, VPNs, all, all sorts of techniques to launch this horrific campaign against her sending intimate images and stories not only to her and her co-workers and friends but to her parents her parents co-workers um, calling in bomb threats um, signing her up for fetish sites um, I mean it, it really uh, it, it, and what what really sort of challenged my views in many ways about anonymity with this case so I I read through the really voluminous court records for this case, but I also spoke with her and she um, talked about how she went, I mean, she, it wasn't really a mystery who it was to her. She, mm -hmm. she, she was sure who it was, but um, there's a difference between being sure who it was and being able to get them to stop and have them prosecuted, or at least somehow get them to stop using legal means. So she went to the local police and they really wanted to help her. And one police officer was so dedicated to this that he went and, and took computer classes, but they weren't able to. And by some stroke of fortune, she ended up being acquainted with an acquaintance of Carrie. Uh, this was several months later and got in touch with Carrie and Carrie represented her and Carrie knows 
all the folks at DOJ and the FBI, computer crimes. And because uh, this involved, one of the things he did was he sent child sex abuse material and it also involved bomb threats. So the FBI and DOJ got involved and they were able to basically, he, uh, based on how he had used a VPN, they were able to get enough evidence uh, to bring charges. He pled guilty and then was sentenced to uh, 17 and a half years in prison. But this very, as the woman told me, this very, very easily could not have been a DOJ case. Uh, There were certain characteristics that made it that. And um, so that then I I spend some time looking at, you know, how could, how did anonymity shape this? And obviously, because he was able to hide enough of his identifying information, he was able to engage in this really harmful content conduct. Um, But how would changing the First Amendment protections have altered that Mm -hmm. or helped that? And I don't know how much they would have, because if I mean, if she had sued him, which I I think for a variety of reasons would not have been terribly effective, just a civil suit. I mean, I I can't imagine a court uh, quashing the subpoena in that case, even under the high standards. Um, I guess that uh, some countries have real name requirements, which I think would be unconstitutional in the United States. But even then, I think there are ways, I mean, as we see with Facebook, there are ways to circumvent real name requirements. And yeah. Um, so I looked at, you know, what, what else could be done? And I mean, I think first the experience with law enforcement tells me that, you know, in, with other sorts of crimes, uh, you don't always have law enforcement say, you know, we really want to help you. We just don't have experience with dealing <laughs> with this sort with, with this sort of thing. And so I, I really hope that local and state law enforcement invest more heavily in expertise on cyber crimes because they're not going away. They're only going to get worse. Um, I also think identifying I, identifying threats or troubling behavior among youths early. Um, yeah. His, his file his file showed some behavioral issues from when he was back when he was in middle school. Um, I, I know it's hard it's hard to sort of spot what those would turn into, but I, I think that there there are a lot of interventions that I, I think would be more effective uh, because I don't know how changing anonymity would necessarily, I, I don't know how it could actually be effective because I think if someone really is dedicated, they're going to be able to circumvent barriers. Uh, but then the people who actually really legitimately rely on anonymity for a good reason, they might say, you know, I don't want to break the rules, so I'm not going to. So. I, I think that's where it gets really, really difficult uh, to sort of evaluate. But I, I think it's more than just looking at, okay, how do we restrict being anonymous? Because I don't know if that will actually solve the underlying problem. So when you started the book, I'm curious, I hope you'll answer this. Do you think that you were in your own mind hoping to correct or debunk your own assumptions about your view of anonymity and the value of it. I'm so curious if you felt just privately when you started writing, I'm really more leaning in this pro anonymity posture. And I realize that's a little reductive, but as I hear you talk, I can kind of hear you talking yourself out of and then talking yourself out Mm -hmm. of the counter positions. And I'm curious, just that personal writing and drafting experience um how did you did you wrestle with somehow feeling like you were torn between sides oh yeah i mean i went back i mean i had like a million drafts i was (laughs) uh, i mean all through the editing process i was tweaking things and i i mean ultimately i i think that there are some things that could be improved um and I, I mean, I, I think the issue is, and I mean, I looked at a lot of research, uh, social science research about online anonymity. And what I saw was that, you know, a lot of my, I, I probably came into the project much more willing to write something more negative about anonymity. And this book is not sort of just a tribute to anonymity. I talk about some of the harms, but um, when you look at some of the social science research, what you see is that people are, and, and this sort of does, it's it's coherent with my experiences, which is that when people operate under their real names online, they 
actually get more aggressive. And this is kind of what the research has found and that people who operate under pseudonyms often focus much more on the argument they're making. And it's not as much of a personal attack than it is sort of trying to have a substantive discussion. I mean, I'm in my neighborhood, I'm, I'm on our next door, next door group, uh, which all is under real names. And I actually participated in my first ever next door thread or responded to a next door thread to, um, something that had like hundreds of comments. They were all, and I, I was like, I can't do it. I can't do it. But it, it was something about dog poop, <laughs> which is like half of what's on next door. Um, but, but people got really vicious and they always do, which is why I avoid it. Um, and, and I think that, uh, and Facebook is the same way. I mean, Facebook has a real name policy. It's not terribly well enforced. Um, but they, they have one and I think a lot of people go by it. And um, it's not like Facebook is the model of civility. Uh, and then you look at, I, I spend a chapter looking at real name policies. You look at Reddit and Twitter, which have really made the ability to be pseudonymous, something that's sort of core to their product. And um, what you've seen in research is that, I mean, this is actually something for example, the LGBT community has really relied on um, yeah. to be, a, and that's what we've seen throughout the history of our country, that groups that don't have the luxury of being anonymous um, or, or, of, or of speaking under their real names uh, rely on being anonymous. So, I mean, I, I can speak under my real name. I, I mean, I'm a tenured professor. I can, I mean, I have a lot of advantages that I don't, that I can say things, um, but there are a lot of people who don't have that, that luxury. Um, Jillian York at EFF, yeah. uh, she, she calls all of these proposals, they're like every few months, there are these proposals to say, let's just require every social media company to register people under their real names and that'll solve everything. And Jillian calls that the white man's gambit. Mm -hmm. uh, as, as a white man, I can say, yeah, that's an appropriate, uh, characterization because I think it, it really does demonstrate pretty effectively that certain groups are much more able to use their real name. So these restrictions on anonymity will disproportionately harm uh, groups that don't have that ability. Mm -hmm. Well, when I teach about the First Amendment and sort of just this bigger concept around what free expression means, the value of being able to speak, to listen, to engage, one of the things that I often ask my students is what I think uh, the, the sort of hardest nut or nugget within teaching the First Amendment is, which is where is the line, so to speak, the line between allowable speech and then everything else? And that's the question that whether it's in a legal context, a moral context, uh, any other conversation, people will have very intense opinions mm -hmm. that there is a body of content of speech that's over here. And then there's this other stuff, you know, it can hurt someone, maybe it can incite, it can offend, it can maybe cause other harms. And in the online realm, we've just seen the explosion of both confusion and nuance and our, I think our policy leaders and other leaders really not quite know as they wrestle with the question of what to do. Is it really a First Amendment issue? Not often. And I try to make that clear to people that what happens online may not, in part illuminated by you in your first book, you know, may not actually be a question of government censorship. And so the question of a line being drawn and what the government can or cannot do is not what we're considering anymore. It's something else. And I'm not sure there's necessarily a question in there, but just the, the, the tension and like how we've gotten to a moment where the questions themselves are so nuanced. That's something that I try to hear and walk through with students to kind of make them aware of how difficult it is that this moment is just so complex. I'm curious for some of your reactions to that. Yeah, so I mean, the, and this comes really more from my Section 230 experience because the book came out in 2019. I started writing it in 2015. And when I was writing it in 2015, 
I'll say there were a number of academic publishers who were like, this is far too obscure, even for an academic <laughs> publisher. Uh, nobody knows what Section 230 is. So I, f I found an academic publisher that was thankfully willing to take a chance on this weird law. Um, but if in 2015 you had told me that five years from now there will be presidential campaign rallies where the candidate is talking about Section 230 at a rally, and the other candidate also is saying that Section 230 should be repealed, I would say that you were absolutely bonkers, that there's no possible way that this is happening. But it has. And so over the past few years, I mean, pretty much every week, at least once, once a week, I'm meeting with staffers mm -hmm. on the Hill or members of Congress um, who all have really, I, I, I push back on this narrative that, you know, Congress doesn't understand technology at all. Um, I think they do. I, I mean, I think some members understand it better than others. I think staffers really understand it. It's not like they're like, oh, what's a computer? Like, I mean, they, they know <laughs> they know what they know what it is and they, they know what the technology is. The problem is that we're so far apart on yeah. consensus as to what the problem is. And so, I mean, they, they'll always ask me, um, well, what's your solution? What's your proposed solution? And I say, okay, to what problem? And when I talk with sort of individual interest groups, they are very clear on what the problem is. It's either harmful content or it's, you know, platforms are censoring us. And there is, they're so far apart. Because when I talk with the members and the staffers, it's the same thing. I'd say half the people I speak with on the Hill are really legitimately concerned about harmful content. Some of it is First Amendment protected. So with or without 230, it's not something that we're going to regulate away. Um, but some of it is defamation and things that can be uh, can be addressed with 230 reform. But then the other half say, you know, why are we giving this immunity to an industry that so unfairly discriminates against people with our political viewpoints. And um, and it, I try to explain, well, if you got rid of 230, they'd probably take down more content, but that's not really the issue. The issue is why, why would we give them what they view as a subsidy? Is, you know, mm -hmm. why, why do we provide this immunity that so few other industries have anything even close to it when they're just basically saying we're going to take down con th this sort of content and you try to explain well there's certain policies and standards and they try to apply them evenly but i mean they it, it it's an issue that needs to be addressed in terms of you know how do we get some uh agreement because i mean i i think that if you want to even look at changing 230 then you you first have to figure out what's your goal here. And I mean, even if you do change 230, you still have First Amendment protections. I mean, I think the First Amendment does protect platforms from being forced to keep content up. Uh, I don't think that platform that social media platforms are like the phone company. Um, <laughs> we we have some people uh, who disagree with me on that, but I but but I I also think that you know. I, very frequently I get people on the other side who say, well, we've got to deal with misinformation. So we have to amend section 230. I'm like, okay, well, what, what do you mean by misinformation? Because a lot of that is constitutionally protected. So you can't deal with it through, it, it's a problem, but you're not gonna fix it by eliminating or making changes to 230. So, but, but I mean, my, ultimately we're so far apart from the vision of what the internet should look like um that mm -hmm. i don't i i i think it, it's su such such disagreement that i i don't know uh, what changes would satisfy at least even a majority right now one of the biggest worries i have when it comes to the harms online and this is to your question you may ask staffers and members of what's you know define the problem one of the problems I find is really the kinds of, um, you know, extractive data practices we see by platforms themselves that are gathering data about us. And there has been 
what seems to be a rather encouraging movement within Congress and in Washington to think about privacy related protections, a federal roadmap of some sort. And I'm curious as it relates to your new book now on anonymity, you know, just as we think of those potentials to pass federal privacy legislation, how might that impact the ability for one to feel empowered through anonymity? Do you think that it would? Yeah, so I, I do. I think private. So, so what I write about in the book toward the last part of it is that, you know, the First Amendment, despite sort of what you see in a lot of the current debate, the First Amendment applies to state action. So it says that in the anonymity context, it says that, you know, the Congress can't pass a law that requires real names on social media because that's government action. Uh, it, it applies to subpoenas, even though they're uh, sought by private parties because they're using the power of the judiciary. But the First Amendment does not restrict the purely private actions, the purely private decisions of a private social media company. And there was a time when this was not controversial. I'll say that there are some people who will disagree with me on that. So the problem is that so much of our identifying information is not going to be addressed and protected by the First Amendment as we have more as, uh, I mean, I, I think could best be described um, by, by Shoshana Zuboff as, uh, as surveillance capitalism, that we have these pri private companies. And I'm not just talking about the big tech companies. I'm frankly more concerned about the data brokers that mm -hmm. uh, sell your geolocation information. And can which even without your name, I mean, I live in a place where nobody else works at the Naval Academy. So if someone gets a geolocation set where someone every day is traveling from my neighborhood to the Naval Academy, that's identified me. And if there's anything yes. that I, any online commentary or anything that is associated with that, then that's identified me. You have uh, Kashmir Hill's excellent reporting on Clearview AI. And, um, I, I think we do need, so we need privacy laws because you're, you can't rely on the First Amendment to address that. And um, I'm worried about the direction in which our privacy laws have gone um, because mm. we've had basically non-action for like two decades in Congress. Uh, I mean, they're like, okay, we'll regulate videotape rentals in the 1980s because of Robert Bork's records being accessed and we'll have health privacy and financial institution privacy rules, but nothing generally. Um, so the states have started to do it. And I don't think the states have done a very good job. Um, and I not to I, I don't think it's their fault, but I I think both procedurally it's not terribly effective. I think the the substance of it, uh, basically giving people choice and access, I think that's good. I think it's a good step. And I say in the book that I think it's a good step, but I don't think it's going to solve everything um, in part because I'm talking about data brokers like I, I don't know who has all of my data and mm -hmm. it's putting a big burden on individuals to figure that out. I mean, what I'd like to see in addition to those choices is to have restrictions on companies that say, OK, there are certain things that you cannot do with personal data. And I mean, you've kind of seen that in the um, local government context involving facial recognition, where some local governments have just said, you know, you're not law enforcement is not able to use facial recognition, so they can't use Clearview. And I think that we need to have a much broader discussion at the federal level. Now, that that's what I'd like to see. I'm also realistic. I've been in D.C. for far too long, and I think that despite you know all, all of the uh, upset about big tech i think that this would be even far harder to pass than a section 230 bill because uh, this will affect every type of company <laughs> and and when you put all the companies together that's a lot of lobbyists and mm -hmm. i worry just i mean i my expectations might have just been battered from being in dc for too long but I just think, you know, I I don't I don't see anything really meaningful when it affects such a wide range of companies. I, I really hope I'm wrong because I think we need it. And mm -hmm. I think we need it to protect anonymity as well as other vet privacy values. Um, mm -hmm. 
but I, I'm not terribly optimistic about it. Mm -hmm. Well, limits on data brokers and what they can do, or frankly, the way that they are currently selling our information to any other party, including intelligence agencies, is one that often worries me. And when it comes to this sort of what's happening under the surface, I think most lay people have no idea what's really happening with their information. Mm -hmm. um, you know, of course you do, or I do, because we're in these issues every day. But for the most part, I think much of what happens to our data and, you know, very personal information, people either don't know, or they say, well, if that helps me have a better online experience, great. Yeah. You know, then I can get my personalized ads. And so there is uh, one, I think, quite a bit of public education to do. And then, of course, the work of how do we properly reform and think of the policy solutions that take this on in a more meaningful way beyond just, as you've said, you know, choice for consumers, but more restrictions or or at least guardrails around what uh, those other third parties can and can't do. I've started getting questions in the chat. Thank you all. Um, I want to we have a few now, Jeff, and we have about 12 minutes and I don't want to go over. So uh, I guess I'll sort of start with some of the bundled questions around some international considerations here. Um, one, you know, we, of course, know that so much of what's happening online in the social media context is a lot of anonymous political speech coming from what one anonymous uh, question asker has called foreign robots wearing tracksuits speaking in a Russian accent. Um, and that prompts for me the question then of, you know, how do we think about what to do with that anonymous political speech? And is there maybe another international example that we can learn from in thinking about how do we protect uh, legitimate interests for anonymity while minimizing the harm that it may bring? Yeah, so I mean, I I think that th that raises a bunch of different questions. Um, so I mean, one one thing in terms of the foreign misinformation, um, there's one one thing that, and I I try to sort of grapple with this in the book is, um, what's what about the ability to receive anonymous speech and also to anonymously receive speech, which are two yeah. separate issues, and we don't have as much. Um, good case law on that. We have some court opinions about there being a right to receive speech um, from the 1960s. Um, Joseph Tai, a law professor, has uh, he's probably written the most sort of on point articles about uh, being the right to receive foreign speech, which I would highly recommend. And I don't think there are any easy answers because we we've not um, in sort of the misinformation context and the Russian bots, we've not um, necessarily dealt with that uh, with with that particular issue. I don't know how to solve it easily because, I mean, again, Facebook has always had a real name policy, and they were not immune from the twenty sixteen election from having uh, some. Uh, a lot of uh, foreign interference and. I mean, I think part of it is that we too often conflate um, impersonation with anonymity, and those are two different issues. So, I mean, almost every platform, the big platforms at least, they all prohibit impersonation. And if someone's impersonating someone else, they're kicked off. Uh, but that's different than being anonymous. And so I don't know, uh, I mean, I, th there are technological solutions for at least some of it, not all of it, but I mean, and the platforms are getting better on that. Um, in terms of other countries, um, it, it's hard. I mean, the, so Germany actually uh, had, so in a lot of Europe, the subpoena standards are lower. Uh, it's easier to subpoena someone, but Germany has um, actually, they, they've, it's sort of still in the court system, but they've challenged Facebook's real name policy as a privacy violation. And so that that's one area where, and I talk in the book about how in the United States, we really view anonymity as a free speech issue. And we, I mean, it, it makes sense because we have a very strong First Amendment and the courts have interpreted anonymity through the lens of the First Amendment. But in Europe and also in Canada, they have their anonymity protections come 
also from their privacy values. Uh, the Canadian courts, when they look at anonymity, they also consider PEPIDA, which is their privacy law. So um, most of, or many other countries, I would not look to for protecting anonymity uh, because many other countries either have real name registration requirements or real name posting requirements. Uh, China has a requirement that you have to register under your real name with the government, but you can post under a pseudonym, which to me is not <laughs> all that much different than just having to post under a pseudonym if the Chinese government knows who your name is, uh, what your name is. So, yeah, I mean, I, I think that there's not, I, I mean, I, I think in a lot of ways, the United States has some, some of the most robust protections, but again, because it's limited to the First Amendment and the First Amendment is limited to state action, that's where we have some boundaries. Mm -hmm. uh, one of my favorite, just in sort of a follow up here to this question is uh, my, one of my favorite thinkers on this issue is really David Kay's work mm -hmm. on anonymity in the global context. And I'm sure you are familiar with his report from 2015. Yeah. Um, he has, uh, I would say, a rather stringent view of um, what guardrails should look like and really what the value of both encryption and anonymity mm -hmm. are in the global context, which I'll just flag and, and say that it's he does a tremendous job of looking at this mm -hmm. issue. He and I have frankly uh, disagreed on quite a bit when it comes to the very clear need he feels for anonymity, even when it may allow for the flourishing of harms. And we've we've disagreed on this before, but it's a great report to at least for those in the audience to dip your toe into that international question. We have a few more questions, Jeff, um, and only a couple of minutes. So I wanna sort of uh, pick one more from the audience and then I'll close us out with a couple of final things. Do you think that the political backlash to quote unquote censorship, whether that is credible or not, is changing the calculus for how people view anonymous speech? Um, you know, I, I think that, um, the political backlash to misinformation is so the sort of the other side of the debate, I think that mm. I think the uh, on the side that say there's too much censorship by platforms. Um, I don't think they're they're not focused as much on anonymity. It's more the folks who are saying, you know, we have to look at the harms and there there's this misperception that frankly i had when i started writing the book that anonymity equals harms uh letting people speak without their names attached means that there's some way to avoid responsibility and so it's going to be a bad thing and i i think that's really where more of the threat is coming from mm. Well, I want to give you a chance to have a couple of closing comments, and I'm curious just to kick us off, you know, what comes next for you? You've, you've written this book. I encourage everyone to buy it. Uh, it is a blast to read, actually. Uh, and how are you thinking about your own work now in this context? Yeah, so this book actually has led into the book I'm currently writing. Um, oh, no, which... you're such an overachiever, Jen. No. You do this to me. <laughs> so oh. it, I, I decided to take on a um, a topic that doesn't have any controversy, which is explaining why the First Amendment protects a lot of false speech. Um, so <laughs> okay, if, great. everyone's going to agree with me uh, for during during the time when everyone is worried about misinformation. I'm taking the really uh, popular stance that the First Amendment does and should continue to protect a lot of false speech. Um, and so I'm kind of the first half of the book traces the various contexts in which U.S. courts under both the First Amendment as well as common law and statutes have protected uh, the ability and why courts have said we should protect false speech. And then the second half looks at, you know, how do you deal with misinformation within this framework without compromising that framework? So um, and that really came out of this anonymity book because it really lo looking at like the question about you know the anonymous speech coming from uh foreign actors that sort of thing that 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 really did get me thinking about how do you you know the first amendment protects so much speech and you can't just pass an anti-misinformation law 
and why is that? And so, yeah, I, I, I think there are other ways to more effectively deal with uh, these harms than just saying we're gonna censor more speech. Mm, well, that is very exciting. Uh, certainly, I one of my favorite things about all of your work is uh, your laying out what perhaps misconceptions are about issues and then the very elegant debunking of why that because of history and our legal jurisprudence and other elements is actually somewhat flawed and um i see that in the first amendment context all the time you know so many people will say we're more divided than ever and yet we've been quite divided throughout history on a number of issues and certainly when it comes to speech and expression and so I really love and always value the way that you take that on carefully, um, whether it's in the digital context or you know other speech context. So I'm thrilled to hear about this new book. I want to make a final plug as we wrap up for the United States of Anonymous. Jeff Kossif, you are fantastic. You're such a star. It's wonderful to always be with you. Uh, people can buy the book where, Jeff? Uh, they could buy it on Amazon. It's available on Amazon. It's on Kindle. There's an audible version. Uh, Cornell Press's website uh, has copies. Uh, my personal favorite Powell's has copies. So yeah, it's pre pretty widely available on the various websites. Wonderful. Well, thank you all for tuning in. I will be closing us out. The United States of Anonymous, How the First Amendment Shaped Online Speech is, I would say, a must read. It is not overwhelming. It's exciting. And I encourage everyone to, to get a copy. So thank you, Jeff. Thank you, Andres, Thanks for so your much. wonderful introduction. Thank you to the rest of the Future Tense team for making today possible. And we'll see you next time. Thanks.